Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, as Hoshin mentioned, we continue today with our exploration of the 108 Gates of Dharma Illumination. And again, um, this text is uh, mostly a long quote from another text called the Sutra of the Collected Past Deeds of the Buddha. So um, this was a piece that was included in the as the 11th fascicle of the 12th fascicle version of Dogen's Shobogenzo. Genzo. He did not compile this list or write it, um, but he has some things to say about it. So um, he at the end of this thing, there was a paragraph or two of uh, comment from him, pretty much just encouraging us to look at all these gates, practice with all these gates. Uh, and also, as we know, um, there are other parts of the Shobogenzo that apply to this uh, section of this text that we're working on. We're wrapping up a section now that's describing the 37 constituent factors of Bodhi, uh, and Dogen wrote about those, so we'll look at those as well. So we're on the last grouping, finally. Uh, seven branches of the balanced truth is one way to translate that. So our gate statement for today says, the balanced state as part of the state of truth is a gate of Dharma illumination, for with it we recognize that all dharmas are in equilibrium. So what this gate calls the balanced state uh, can also be translated as right concentration, or for us, zazen, or shikantaza. Uh, we've encountered right concentration, or the term concentration, uh, in gate statements before, so that's not new territory, and at that point we were able to see um, the connection there with our sitting practice with zazen. So um, all dharma being, all dharmas being in equilibrium uh, is the way we see things from the standpoint of emptiness or non-discrimination, right? So all, all beings, all everything we encounter is in equilibrium uh, because we see the way Buddha saw, right? We see through the eyes of emptiness. So we might restate this gate as in Zazen, we know emptiness. It's pretty much as simple as that. <laughs> in our sitting practice, we're in touch with emptiness or we know emptiness. So again, this isn't our first go around with these topics. Uh, in our work with the 108 gates in gate 13, we said that with our insight into the true nature of reality, we give rise to magnanimous mind, right? The, the three minds for which Sanchin is named magnanimous mind, or the mind of non-discrimination, or the mind of inclusivity. Back in gate 49, that was all about the equality of all elements. We spent a whole talk talking about the equality of all elements and how when we give up discriminative thinking, we can also give up rules and guidelines. Uh, because we go beyond good and bad. So it seems a bit counterintuitive. Uh, but when we see clearly, when we know what to do for ourselves, we can give up uh, the need to cling to precepts, rules, guidelines. Doesn't mean we don't practice with them, but it means we can think about them a little bit differently. Gate 61 was all about balance and concentration and keeping the mind from wandering around so that we could get to non-separation. Right? How do we stay focused? How do we stay concentrated? So today I want to look at what Dogen has to say about the elements of this gate um, and then suggest some ways that this teaching about all dharmas being equal can actually go wrong in dharma centers. We can actually not practice terribly skillfully with this teaching about non-separation, which is kind of interesting. So <clears throat> we know right concentration as one of the elements of the Eightfold Path. It's what Uchiyama Roshi describes as settling down in quietness, which is a nice a description of that, when we settle down, we concentrate, we refine our practice by letting go of whatever is extra. So when we talked about concentration before, we said one of the ways to think about that, when we think about something being concentrated, we're letting go of whatever is extra. So if we're sitting Zazen and we are concentrating, we're letting go of everything that's extra because we only do four things in Zazen, right? We take this posture, we keep the eyes open, we breathe through the nose, we let go of thought, anything else is extra. So when we're sitting Zazen, we are concentrating, we are refining because we're letting go of things that are extra. So that includes the habituated thinking and the stories and the ideas that keep us from really deeply understanding that we're not separate from anything else. That's already true. That's not something we have to work to achieve. That non-separation is already there. You know, that's the absolute view or the viewpoint from emptiness where nothing has a fixed and permanent self that we can grab onto and say, you know, this is the nature of this thing and it's never gonna change. And it's something that I can cling to, right? So this gate says that in concentration of zazen, we see the way that Buddha sees. We encounter things the way Buddha encounters them with impartiality uh, and kind of equality, right? Non-discrimination, non-separation. So Dogen's comment about this topic is balance as a limb of the truth, or this 
particular constituent factor of Bodhi, is before the moment, preserving the eye that precedes the moment. It is blowing our own noses and it is grasping our own rope and leading ourselves. Having said that, it is also being able to graze a castrated water buffalo. Okay. <laughs> so, before the moment, preserving the eye that precedes the moment. So before taking an action, preserving the viewpoint of emptiness or non-discrimination is there before we make the choice to do whatever it is we're going to do. Before we decide this situation is positive, negative, neutral, uh, this feels good, this doesn't feel good. So preserving the eye that can see what's happening before that reflex kicks in as human beings. So not losing track of what's there before we choose before we start making distinctions and discriminations and then start chasing after things and running away from things and doing the things that we do as human beings, right? So that place is where we're sitting in Zazen. That, that place that we're sitting in, that space, that container that we're in when we're sitting in Zazen is the place where we preserve that eye that sees what's going on before the habituated thinking kicks in. Blowing our own noses, grasping our own rope and leading ourselves. So without relying on fixed rules, without relying on other people's viewpoints to tell us what to do, we see reality clearly for ourselves. And we know what the skillful action is because we're not hindered by craving an aversion and chasing and running away and all that stuff, right? So here again, we come to this teaching about seeing the equality of all dharmas that allows us to go beyond good and bad. It allows us, allows us to go beyond labeling and judging um, and still be able to take skillful action and navigate this world as bodhisattvas. So that doesn't mean, of course, that it doesn't matter what we do. Um, it doesn't mean there aren't wholesome and unwholesome actions. It doesn't mean there are things that, not things that perpetuate suffering and things that liberate ourselves and other beings from suffering. It means we don't need to judge and label what's good or bad or wholesome or unwholesome and get caught up in that whole discriminative process. We can see the working of the network of interdependent origination and the choices about what will keep that network in the healthiest possible state. So the choice is not about what makes me feel good or what benefits me personally, um, regardless of the impact on other beings. The choice is about what keeps that network healthy, what keeps it uh, moving the way it should be moving. But it's also about being able to graze a castrated water buffalo. <laughs> okay, well, so this is a reference to another Shobogenzo fascicle called Kajo, or Everyday Life. And now we need to go down the rabbit hole for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> and explore some things and then work our way back out, right? This is what we do <laughs> with these gates. So Dogen quotes Zen master Enchi Dayan, who says that he spent 30 years going about his everyday life on his mountain, in his temple, with his folks, doing his everyday mundane activities, but not learning Zen. So he's simply eating every day, sleeping, doing his work, carrying out his daily life, not particularly making some effort to learn something called Zen. Instead, he just watched over a castrated or domesticated water buffalo. So a water buffalo in this <clears throat> story, in this um, venue, is not an exotic thing. For us, if we saw a water buffalo walking down the street here, we would think that was kind of unusual. <laughs> uh, for these folks, a water buffalo is not an exotic thing. It's a working animal. And even today, more people around the world depend on them than any other domestic animal. When I was in China, I mean, you see herds of these things, and there people are herding them across the river, and they're wandering around. Water buffalo is, a, is an important um, element of people's lives. It's, uh, they're particularly good for tilling rice fields, so it's important in agriculture, but also they give it very rich milk. So there's more than one way that these animals are important for people, but it's very much about domestic daily existence. So uh, Inchi Dayan says about this buffalo, when it strayed into the grass, I dragged it out. When it invaded another seed patch, I whipped it. Though disciplined for a long time already, as a pitiful creature, it suffered people's remarks. Now it has turned into a white ox on open ground. It is always before me. All day long, it is in a state of conspicuous brightness. Even if driven away, it does not leave. So in other words, he had to train this water buffalo not to make mistakes, not to go into somebody else's patch and trample on their crops, um, you know, to, to go where it shouldn't go and do things that it shouldn't do. This was hard work for him, and it sounds like not so pleasant for the water buffalo. <laughs> he was, this water buffalo was being, you know, shouted at by people and 
disciplined by him with his stick. And, you know, this was not a, a fun thing for him or for the water buffalo. And, of course, this is an allegory for this teacher's own practice, uh, his own training. He's training and disciplining himself. So he is the water buffalo wandering around making mistakes. So then he says the water buffalo has turned into a white ox on open ground. So now he's referring to the famous story in the Lotus Sutra where the children are playing in the burning house, right? Everybody knows this story. They're too busy playing with their toys to notice that the house is on fire and to try to get out and try to escape and save themselves. So their dad tries to get them to come out by telling them that there are these three lovely toy carts outside. Don't they want to come out and play with these things? So the kids get excited about the carts. Of course, they come running out of the house and they and their dad all sit together on open ground. So um, instead of the three little toy carts, of course, dad presents them with this great white ox, really impressive great white ox. So the allegory here is that we're all, of course, so caught up in chasing and running away from, right? Uh, being attached to and playing with all the things of our samsaric world. We don't realize we're trapped in that samsaric world. And, uh, you know, with all of our burning desires, this is the burning house, we don't realize that we're stuck and we don't make any attempt to get out. So Buddha tries to get us out by offering three different kinds of teachings as expedient means. I'm summarizing greatly, of course, <laughs> right? So three toy carts or three carts outside, uh, three kinds of expedient uh, teachings. But actually there's only one Buddha way and only one unified reality, and this is the great white ox. So for Inchi Dayan, the 30 years of training this everyday domesticated water buffalo has resulted in his awakening or somehow after 30 years of discipline, he's in touch with his own awakening. He sees the great white ox or the Buddha way all day long, whether he wants to see it or not. He says, uh, even if driven away, it doesn't leave. So it's, there it is. He can't not see it, right? He can't unsee the Buddha way or the great white ox. Okay, so now let's go back and tie everything together <laughs> in this Dogen comment. We've gone various places, now let's come back. So again, his comment says, balance as a limb of the truth is before the moment preserving the eye that precedes the moment. It is blowing our own noses and it is grasping our own rope and leading ourselves. Having said that, it is also being able to graze a castrated water buffalo. So we need to be able to see emptiness and non-discrimination in the moment before we choose an action and take that action. If we can do that, then we don't need to be told what to do. We don't need to cling to rules, guidelines, because we can see clearly we already know for ourselves what that skillful action is. Having said that, we have to practice and train ourselves in order to be able to see the way that Buddha sees. So Zazen is one place where maybe we can best see all dharmas being in equilibrium, as this gate statement says. Um, or all things being empty. So again, it's not, it's not that we need to sit Zazen in order to acquire that awakening or to get something we don't have. Um, there's no outcome that we're striving for in our Zazen, but somehow in that space, we are perhaps best able to see the way Buddha sees and to see that all beings are empty of any fixed and permanent self nature. And perhaps to uh, put ourselves in that space before we're making those choices about what we're going to do, what we're going to say, what we're going to think, how we're going to create karma. So we also have to be guided by precepts and teachers and forms until we can let go of them and stand up on our own. So in addition to uh, spending that time on the cushion and in Zazen, of course, uh, you know, we still need to listen to people who have been on this path a little longer than we have, <laughs> whether that's Buddha or teachers or Sangha friends. Um, because in the beginning, and probably forever, we can't completely stand up on our own. Buddha-san says we're baby bodhisattvas, right? We can't yet completely do this without some help. Um, so, you know, for a while, we need the handrails, what I call the handrails. We need something to hold on to, to give us some guidance and some direction. And when we see clearly for ourselves, we can let go of the handrail because we know what to do. We know how to be skillful. When we can do that, then our lives are complete manifestations of Buddha nature in the ways that precepts describe. So, you know, we can't spend a lot of time on precepts here today, but we know precepts are not simply lists of do this, don't do that. Precepts are a description of how we live our lives when we're in touch with awakening, when we're completely manifesting Buddha nature, right? It's a description of that. So we manifest emptiness in the midst of form all the time. You know, we can't drive away the great white ox. Somehow in the midst of this life of form, we are manifesting emptiness all the time. 
So again, the original gate statement, the balanced state or concentration or zazen for us as a part of the state of truth is a gate of Dharma illumination for with it, we recognize that all dharmas are in equilibrium. So we always have to be careful how we take in and practice with teachings about non-discrimination, I think, because there's some pitfalls there. It would be easy to think we only live in the world of non-discrimination or that that's a place we're trying to get to and then we leave everyday life behind us someplace, right? Um, there are some wonderful insights that come with practicing with and studying non-discrimination. Um, it is one element of truth. It is part of this one unified reality. Uh, but there are also some holes we can kind of fall into in some ways that we can misunderstand these teachings. Uh, we can't see only non-discrimination or only emptiness. We also have to see and acknowledge differences. Um, or we can't function effectively. We can't you know, carry out our bodhisattva responsibilities. We can't function in the world if we're going to completely give up all discriminative thinking. We have to know the difference between a red light and a green one if we're driving a car. Right? We have to know, you know what is poison and what is good food or we're not going to last very long. So we have to be able to make discrimination. And yet, right? it's not the whole picture. So um, if we decide that we only want to live in the world of emptiness or the absolute or something, either because this world feels painful or because we think somehow we're going to be better practitioners or you know, all the stories we tell ourselves, um, actually we're more likely to perpetuate suffering than to liberate beings from suffering um, if we're stuck there because it's not the whole picture. So these days, a number of sanghas, including ours, are considering how to be more inclusive, how to work carefully with discrimination and non-discrimination when it comes to things like diversity and inclusivity, and how to make sure that everybody feels welcome in the Dharma Center and everyone feels cared for when they get here. So we might summarize uh, the wish of diverse practitioners, but really all of us, uh, is to be safe and to be seen in our Dharma centers, in our sanghas, right? We would all like to be safe and we'd all like to be seen. Um, we've, we all have different characteristics. We all have different karmic circumstances. We are not identical people, even those that dress similarly, <laughs> right? There are individual people inside of here. So as a sangha, how do we practice carefully and skillfully with the fact that we all have kind of one direction, we've all got a similar aspiration, and yet we're all coming into the zendo, into the Dharma Center with different karmic circumstances in oh so many ways, right? When we're talking about diversity and inclusion, yeah, race, but everything, you know, none of us are, are identical. So this is not just a policy thing for board members to, to, to think about or to figure out. This gate is pointing us to some important Dharma teachings about diversity and inclusivity and who we are as a Sangha and who we are as a community. So I would like to look at some of the recurring themes in this national conversation about diversity in Dharma centers, particularly. No, I'm talking particularly about Dharma centers. Um, we can see how form and emptiness in this gate statement keep showing up in these conversations. These themes are not my work. This is not something I made up. This is not my own conclusion. These are the things that I am noticing when I am hearing what other teachers are saying, what other practitioners are saying, what other Dharma centers are saying. It's really interesting how Sanghas are practicing with these things and the things that sort of keep arising, right? And, and interestingly, they are all relevant to this gate. How do we think about, how do we practice with, how do we see non-discrimination and yet live in the world of form? So I wrote an article about, uh, so I want to describe uh, statistically uh, who primarily shows up in the American Dharma Center? It tells us something about mostly who's around. I wrote an article about this for Buddha Dharma Magazine in like 2008, right? Um, there are newer figures than that now. Uh, but clearly this is something I've been interested in for a while. So 44% of American Buddhists are white, 33% are Asian, 12% are uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, 8% mixed or other, and only 3% are black. So as we look around the Sangha, we think, well, this is what we're seeing. Um, the relative percentage of Hispanic practitioners or Latino and Latina practitioners is growing. So you know, relative to the whole group, interestingly, that's a group that's growing. So more practitioners make $30,000 or less per year now, and this group is also growing relative to the whole. So the next largest group makes between $50,000 and $100,000. So that tells us something about people's sort of um, economic, socioeconomic state. Uh, those are 
numbers that are before the pandemic, by the way, so they don't represent what may be happening most recently. The majority of practitioners have at least some college education. About a fifth of them hold post-secondary degrees. And recent uh, research in our own sangha shows that at Sanchin, that's about 85% have some kind of college education, bachelor's degree or greater. The number of married practitioners is decreasing. It's now about even with the number of practitioners who have never been married. So that says something about families and how families are maybe practicing. 69% of American Buddhists are Democrats or lean Democratic, and 44% are liberals, 36% are moderates. So there is a quick statistical picture of who, is, who you are the most likely to see in an American Dharma Center. Doesn't cover everybody. Those are just the statistics. So uh, there are also some things that we know about Sanchin specifically, which are interesting. Other than me, just about all the practice leadership here is male. I look around this room, I'm the only woman in the room, which is interesting. That doesn't, you know, that's a pandemic thing, perhaps. That doesn't say anything about who the song is. In the last year, two thirds of the people signing up for our getting started sessions have been men. Most people who come to Sushin are male and usually mid thirties or younger. Uh, interesting, more of the people who come to Genzaway are female and tend to be older. So we see a real distinction uh, across those two events. In the before times, when we weren't under mask mandates and had public uh, health worries, um, the people who practiced here typically, say on a Sunday, were a mix of retired people and young adults. So these are people without young children at home that require some kind of care or attention. Uh, and that reflects the national trend because there's a growing percentage of American Buddhists that are either 20 to 30-ish or 65 or more, 65 or older. So only about a fifth of practitioners have children under 18. So we could describe dominant culture perhaps within American Buddhist centers or within American Buddhist, Buddhism as white, middle-class, liberal, Democrat, no kids at home. <laughs> That's the majority. That's not everybody. That's what we might call the dominant culture. So at Sanshin, also, there's this element somehow of it being particularly male, although nationally the gender distribution is pretty even. If you look at people who self-identify as Buddhists, it's pretty even. So there's something interesting happening here, maybe, I don't know. So with that picture in mind, let's look at these recurring themes about um, dharmas being in equilibrium, how we encounter that and how we think about that. So first trend, it might seem like a good thing to say, we see everybody equally, or to kind of smooth out the differences among the folks that arrive in the Dharma Center as a way to be inclusive. Um, actually, it can be a way to avoid acknowledging our fear of people who arrive and are somehow not exactly like us, whatever us is. Um, they're unlike ourselves. Um, and yet, you know, so yes, there's no distinction in emptiness. Yes, we're all, you know, equal in that way, but we also live in the world of form. So yes, Buddha says everyone has Buddha nature. Awakening is already here. Uh, that doesn't mean it looks the same for everybody. That doesn't mean we all manifest it the same way. So in trying to be welcoming, we can give out a message that you know we don't see you as different from us, therefore you're welcome here, but why should new people have to be like us in order to be included? You know, why, why is the goal, well, you know, we're all going to be the same. Um, it's an interesting intersection to practice with. You know, the subtle message is still, you're not okay being you, you need to be us, whatever that means, right? So under a veil of welcoming and acceptance and, you know, uh, bringing people in that can make us feel good about ourselves, we can still make it unacceptable to be different from whatever the Sangha's dominant culture or worldview or physical form seems to be. So it can be the complete opposite of what we intend, you know, we intend to be welcoming and inclusive and everyone should join us and, you know, we don't see differences. Well, if we don't see differences, are we really seeing people? Are we seeing the entire person or are we seeing our idea, right? So things like I don't see color, you know, may or may not be skillful. They can disregard people's actual karmic circumstances. Um, if I walk in here and says, well, I don't see gender, you're fine, you know, so you're fine here, I'm going to go, what? <laughs> right? We need to see the whole person. So, um, you know, treating people equally is not the same as giving people what they need. So on the one hand, dharmas are in equilibrium. On the other hand, we all have an individual form. So how do we balance these things? How do we hold both of these two things? So another theme I've noticed is, um, you know, folks are saying when we're experiencing some discomfort with what's arising in our practice, and we do, because if we're not challenging ourselves, you know, uh, 
we're missing something, right? Practice tends to challenge us. Uh, so we may be feeling some discomfort with whatever is going on in our practice and our Dharma teachers will sometimes point us back to our own hearts and minds and say, where are we stuck? What are we adding into that picture? What's the story that we're telling ourselves? You know, what are the ideas that we're clinging to? We're reminded not to blame other people for the things that we're experiencing. Um, you know, where are we, where are our own hindrances? And of course, often that's a skillful means, and that's an important redirection because we do need to look at what's happening here. Um, when we're working with a diverse Sangha, though, we need to be careful because we can leave people with the conclusion that whatever inequities they're facing, whatever suffering is arising from that, and whatever suffering is being perpetuated because of that is either all in their own imaginations or all of their own fault. Oh, well, you're suffering because you have some fixed idea about what society should be. Well, <laughs> probably not the whole story, right? So we need to be careful about that stuff. Teaching everybody the same way might not be effective. I mean, Buddha certainly used skillful means. So when we look around at who's in the Sangha, who's actually in front of us, who's coming in the door, who are we participating with, who are we encountering, we have to think carefully about how we're sharing the Dharma. So yes, suffering is a characteristic of human life. It is the first of the Four Noble Truths. It's the first thing that we hear about when we come to the Dharma Center, but people from diverse communities may be experiencing particular forms of suffering. And those particular forms might not be different for everybody. So teachers and sanghas need to see the context of that so that we all get good help. We all get you know, support for our questions about self and how we build self and how we build identity and what the five skandhas are doing and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, how we create karma, how we fit into the network of dependent origination. Um, there needs to be skillfulness around that. It's not a one size fits all, right? So there aren't easy answers for any of that. Uh, for most American Dharma teachers, we all kind of fit into a certain, I don't know, life circumstance maybe. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not black, I'm not transgender, I'm not a mother with a small child, you know, experiencing poverty. Um, my teaching stories, my cultural filters don't necessarily reflect people's experience if that's their current circumstance. Um, so for beginning practitioners in particular, that can be a problem. It can be a hindrance to establishing a practice. People don't address the things that are somehow going on in my life, or there are people who look like they're in my particular karmic circumstances. So that's a challenge, right? There aren't easy answers for that. So how we encounter and treat everybody equally in terms of access to practice and teaching and the Dharma is a live question. Uh, how do we do that and still recognize and affirm differences <coughs> rather than trying to get rid of differences or ignore differences or kind of smooth things over so that we can all be the same and everybody can be comfortable. So third theme I've noticed, uh, diversity and inclusion are not matters of personal emotion. We can all individually be very sincerely friendly and welcoming and very willing to accept whoever comes in the door. Um, we can feel that that's who we are, that's important for us, like we're not hindered in that. And yet, you know, so we can try to exercise our wisdom and compassion all the time and practice with this all the time and still not recognize the obstacles that may be around for people of various karmic circumstances because they're not our obstacles, right? So we can feel like we're not uh, excluding anybody personally and yet there can still be things going on in the Dharma Center or, or obstacles to people practicing. So reaching out to diverse populations and simply kind of inviting them in and saying we welcome everybody and then waiting for them to arrive is probably not enough. There may be reasons they can't come in or feel that they can't come in. Um, it might not be that, that the neighborhood or the community doesn't know that the Dharma Center exists. Everybody might know that the Dharma Center exists. Um, but there might be barriers to participation that just are not so obvious because we uh, need to think carefully about inclusivity, diversity, form, and emptiness. So folks might be dying to come to the Dharma Center and sit Zazen. They might be very interested, but they don't have childcare or they don't have transportation or the building's not ADA compliant or something. They may be worried that there won't be other people here in their similar circumstances. Um, and again, this is not just, you know, racial. It's like, I'm the only woman in the room. <laughs> uh, you know, there are, there are people might come in and say, well, there, there aren't any young people like me, or there aren't any older people like me, or there aren't any Spanish speaking people like me, or you know, 
whatever that might be. Um, these things, they don't see maybe teachers that they can relate to or hear stories that they can relate to. So these might not even occur to the existing Sangha because again, individually, we're happy to welcome everybody. So we don't think about things that are not our own karmic circumstances. So it can be puzzling for good-hearted Sangha members, good-hearted practitioners who say, well, you know, Buddhas and ancestors say everybody does the same zazen, so why can't we all just fold into this practice, right? If we're all sitting zazen, we're entering into that same space, everybody's welcome in that space, so why can't we all just come in and sit down? Okay, and maybe we can look carefully. So we can't just assume that diverse groups don't come to the Dharma Center because they're not interested. Um, you know, it, it doesn't encourage a sort of a broader, deeper conversation about form and emptiness and discrimination and non-discrimination and inclusivity and seeing the way Buddha sees. So, fourth theme that I've noticed. At the same time that we need to listen to the experiences of a diverse group of practitioners and practitioners who identify with whatever group they identify with, um, it's also not their responsibility to resolve whatever the barriers are to practice. So I could come in and say, how come I'm the only woman here? Uh, and you all might look at me and say, well, you should do something about that. <laughs> and I'm going, hmm, you know, now it's on me. So um, ideally, the Sangha as a whole is practicing with form and emptiness and discrimination and discrimination and sameness and difference. And somehow that practice becomes the practice of everybody in all kinds of ways. <clears throat> Sangha makeup being one of those ways, right? So um, we might all be asking ourselves, what might be getting in the way of a new person coming into the Sangha and establishing a practice and you know, digging into the Buddha way? So that's not necessarily a comfortable Dharma gate for us as existing practitioners, right? There's a difference between naming what might be keeping somebody from practicing and blaming somebody for what might be keeping someone from practicing. Identifying what the barriers are doesn't require that we become defensive, right? And this is something we hear in our own practice all the time, right? When we notice a hindrance or somebody points out a hindrance or someplace we've gone off the rails, our impulse is to tighten up and to become defensive and to contract, right? This is just another way to practice with that same kind of teaching. When somebody points out, you know, <laughs> it might be difficult for people to join the Sangha because X, Y, Z. That person isn't blaming us for that. They're just saying, you know, here's something that we've identified. Let's think about form and emptiness related to that. So, um, you know, these are all our karmic circumstances too. We've all been conditioned to see things in a certain way in our practice and in our lives. So it takes time to work with seeing emptiness in Zazen and also seeing the differences in the world and knowing how to integrate those things in a skillful way. So this is just one more Dharma gate. This is one more opportunity to practice with that very um, common core teaching. So once we've started to uncover the barriers, then we might indeed start doing some kind of targeted special things. In some Dharma centers, there are committees, there are trainings, there are special events, there are various things around Dharma and diversity. But we have to be careful not to make this whole form and emptiness question, this whole inclusion question, the particular practice of a subset of the Sangha. Um, it, it would be easy to see this kind of practice as a sort of a subspecialty, right? Again, this is just one more manifestation of a much larger teaching. So we all get to participate in this teaching about holding form and emptiness um, and practicing in that intersection. Um, it's just one more manifestation of you know, the Mahayana theme that says we see one reality from two sides and we express two sides in one action. It's just another way to practice with that. So if we do start looking for someone to turn to advice, to turn to for advice about inclusion, uh, we can quickly see that there are few Dharma teachers of color or who identify with various diverse kinds of groups. There are few, you know, and so these few people often get put in the position of speaking for their entire community. Um, whether, you know, so, so in discussions about Dharma and diversity, somehow the idea is if I identify with a particular group that I can speak about the practice of that entire group because I'm part of that group which, eh, not quite fair, 
right? Again, we have a problem with distinction and not distinction. So we're seeing one person and you know, assuming that person is the same as everybody else in his or her group. And actually there are distinctions within that group, right? Because we're individuals, again, with different karmic circumstances. So suddenly these few people, everyone's turning to them and they are in huge demand by sanghas and conferences and everybody wants to be educated about, you know, how does that particular group practice in the sangha or do they have their own sangha? And simply because of their affiliation with this group, they're getting those requests rather than because of their practice or their credentials as Dharma teachers or, you know, some something about them. So likewise, I've also seen sometimes practitioners from diverse groups get deluged with invitations suddenly to serve on boards, to serve on committees, uh, to participate in various things, uh, regardless of their background, their talent, their interests, but particularly because we're you know, only seeing one aspect, this person identifies with a particular group. Therefore, they must know everything about the practice of that group. Form and emptiness, <laughs> right? Like, what are we actually seeing here? Um, so, um, you know, we have to be careful here about difference and sameness. Because in the midst of trying to work with diversity and inclusion, we can just, you know, take the most obvious characteristic of the person and just see that. So rather than seeing the whole individual, with differences and sameness in karmic circumstances, just like we have and just like everybody else. So um, what if, you know, so, so there's a teacher, there's a board member who is, I don't know, black, transgender, Spanish speaking, something, whatever. Um, therefore, automatically that person is an expert on that issue and the issue is facing that group of practitioners and can speak for them. Doesn't feel okay, right? So what if somebody came to a white or a middle class or a gender conforming Dharma teacher and said, well, please educate us on everything we need to know about, you know, how your group practices. And the answer would be, well, you know, I, we're all different. I can't speak for everyone. I can only tell you about my own experience. So this is true for everybody, right? So we've been talking about, you know, how we look at practice from the point of view of including diverse Sangha members without forcing them to ignore or suppress differences, different karmic circumstances. There's also a recurring theme that's kind of the opposite, which is kind of interesting. So there's a certain amount of cultural appropriation that tends to happen in Dharma centers. Um, and some Asian practitioners say that makes us uncomfortable because white American practitioners can adopt various language habits and aesthetics and gestures and clothing and other elements of personal style that they believe to be Asian in some conscious or unconscious attempt to be more Buddhist, right? So, uh, you know, in the same way, sometimes American Dharma centers are designed or decorated uh, to look Asian as a means of creating a particular practice atmosphere or some kind of exoticism or to be credible or something. Even when the Sangha has no real connection with Asia, maybe nobody's actually practiced there. Maybe the Sangha is primarily white or at least not Asian. Uh, and somehow these stories arise, right? So often these quote unquote Asian characteristics are products of the imagination of the dominant culture in the Sangha. So somehow all these white liberal, middle class liberal, Democrat, no kids at home practitioners believe that they need to be something else in order to practice. They need to be more Asian in order to actually credibly practice, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting idea, right? So somehow it becomes important for them not to be different from what they think a traditional Asian practitioner is. In other words, everybody wants to look like a monk. Right? Everyone wants to be a monk. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a session or some kind of practice event and on the way out the door, somebody says to me, and oh, by the way, where can I buy Samway? Where can I buy practice robes? And I go, you know, not necessary. Wear your clothes. <laughs> you're not an ordained person. You're not Japanese or Asian. You're not a monk. Just, you know, we're a lay, primarily a lay Dharma center. You're just, you know, wear your clothes. And the next time I see them, they bought the Samoa and they're in the practice robes and somehow they feel better, I guess, about their practice. Like that message didn't get in, right? It's like, what are we, what's the story we're telling ourselves about what we need to look like and be like when we practice? Yeah, some of us wear this stuff. This means I've agreed to take on a particular role in the Sangha. That's all that means. I'm not trying to look Japanese because I'm not, right? So we have to be careful about that stuff. Um, you know, because we create this atmosphere and then that atmosphere gets imposed on everybody who comes in. And somehow there's this felt need to, you know, conform to something. Um, including 
you know, Asian practitioners who may show up and not recognize anything that's happening here because we made it up. <laughs> All right? So we have to be careful about our ideas about that. You know, we're trying to be something maybe we're not. We're trying to be, we're trying to include ourselves in a group in a particular way. Yes, honor our ancestors. Yes, appreciate lovely artwork. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But when we look carefully at the motivation and carefully at the self concept and what the five skandhas are clinging to, we just need to be honest about us, honest with ourselves, right? Okay, so. Um, once again, the gate state before today, the balanced state or concentration or zazen, as a part of the state of truth is a gate of dharma illumination for with it we recognize that all dharmas are in equilibrium. So when we work with this gate as it relates to diversity, um, seeing in our zazen and off the cushion that all things including beings are empty of a fixed and permanent self nature, when we encounter each thing and each being the way Buddha does, with impartiality, with non-discrimination. We need to think about why this intersection is important as a container for bodhisattva activity. What is it about this? Um, this whole sometimes fraught conversation about Dharma and diversity, what is it about that that's important? So we don't practice with Dharma, I'm sorry, with diversity and inclusion in order to make ourselves look good, in order to make the Dharma Center look good. You know, it's easy to say we need to do some things in order to look a certain way. Uh, there's a lot of temptation to get caught up in trends. This is a hot topic, as you see in the national conversation at the moment, and it would be easy to just get caught up in it because everybody's talking about it. It's certainly useful to watch what's happening around us. It's useful to pay attention to what are other sanghas practicing with? What are we practicing with? What are other teachers working on? What are the resources that are out there? All that stuff is great. You know, there's, there's, it can be very, very helpful, but our motivation for working with this has to come from our own bodhicitta. It has to come from our own sincere, wholehearted practice. It has to come from our own aspiration, right? To do our bodhisattva work, to be in touch with awakening, to manifest our Buddha nature, to be skillful in the world. So we're also not in this in order to offer the Dharma to some kind of population out there, which may be underserved and suffering and downtrodden and helpless. And, you know, we're gonna go out and save them with our Dharma right? Not what we're in this for. Um, that might sound nice, bringing Dharma to people who need it. Uh, and again, nothing wrong with sharing the Dharma. There may be some very appropriate ways that we can go out in the community and share the Dharma. Uh, but that kind of approach can quickly become an exercise in ego because I'm in a higher position, offering something to somebody in a lower position, so am I not a wonderful person, right? So the outcome of that might be be good. Maybe somebody is sincerely interested in the Dharma or we can help people to practice. Not that we shouldn't be reaching out with the Dharma, but what's going on here while I'm doing that? Am I putting myself here and somebody else down here? It's really subtle, right? It's really subtle. So from the point of view of diverse practitioners, the compelling reason behind all of this is that marginalization creates suffering. And as Buddhists, our first vow is to liberate beings from suffering. So uh, that's what uh, drives our investigation into this gate as it relates to inclusion. If we do it skillfully and we explore and investigate our own clinging to greed and anger and ignorance and all of those you know, three poisons in our practice, and we see how that may be related to issues of marginalization, then those are meaningful, relevant Dharma gates beyond this small conversation. Well, it's not so small, <laughs> beyond this topic, right? This is a much larger practice. This is a gateway into a much larger set of teachings in this tradition. So beginning with individuals ceasing to perpetuate suffering mm -hmm. and Dharma centers ceasing to perpetuate suffering, then Sanghas can move outward to you know, some other kind of community engagement or beneficial action in whatever way feels appropriate, right? So we start with our own hindrances. Where are we stuck individually? Where is the Dharma center perhaps stuck? And then we can move outward from there. So it's helpful to frequently, broadly ask ourselves, how might our practice or teachings or activities be inaccessible to people who are not, who don't look like this dominant culture that I've statistically described? So how might our activities be inaccessible to people who are not able-bodied, white, middle-class, liberal, no children at home, right? Um, and how am I doing in seeing both the truth of emptiness and the truth of karmic circumstances. So how am I holding both of these two things that this gate is bringing up?
So paying attention to these questions, I think helps to make us skillful bodhisattvas. So let me stop talking and hear what others would like to say about uh, this gate, how we hold form and emptiness, how we see difference in sameness, perhaps how that plays out in our interpersonal relationships, uh, particularly within the Sangha, but maybe outside of that. Um, and don't forget, if you're at home, don't forget to unmute so we can hear you. I may not see you, just <laughs> speak up. Okay. So what would you all like to say today? I'm sure people have things to say. These are fraught topics. I know that. Hey, I'll go, I'll go first. This is Fusatsu. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone in the, in the uh, Zendo. Um, again, thank you so much for bringing this topic up. I know we've had this conversation ongoing. Um, one of the ways that I feel like, you know, especially the things that have come up through uh, COVID and through all the other work that we're consistently doing in society is that space and opportunity to have the conversation. Because again, I don't think, you know, any of us really, you know, uh, it's hard to know, you know, what to do at the right time in the conversations. But, you know, I think it's great that some of the Dharma centers are having the opportunity for the conversation, but may not have the resources locally to be able to, 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 to ask the questions in that way. And uh, I'm going to call my, my Dharma brother Shikaku is on today as well. He can speak to this. We talk about this a lot locally in Atlanta. But again, as things are arising, people do have questions on, you know, how and what to do. And then sometimes it's just, uh, again, opening up the conversation, you know, to the group and to the Sangha and to have teachers there. But it always goes back to your intent. And then, you know, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities that the Dharma can teach if we are up to, in the ways of approach. It might not, pro it won't provide the answers as we always know that because everybody wants an answer, right? But can you speak a little bit about creating the spaces locally? Um, and then maybe, like you said, just because, you know, I'm a black female and I'm also a lesbian doesn't mean I'm the right one to have the conversation, but how, what are some of the, the, the ways that, uh, we can actually develop and invite to have that conversation locally to maybe address some issues that we're not locally sourced to, to be able to do. I wish I had an answer. So in this Sangha, you know, we're just beginning these kinds of conversations. And that's a live question for us. Uh, so I don't have an answer for you. Um, I, I, my hope is, though, that we never lose sight of our, um, these are issues that go beyond temple walls, right? And I think as a Sangha, we have an opportunity to investigate them as they relate to our practice. So as Sanghas, we can bring the Dharma to these questions, and that's, that's, that's a resource that's always there. So it doesn't matter where our Dharma centers are in that way, right? The teachings are always there. Um, so when we look at a gate like the gate statement for today, I could have talked about a lot of other things, right? Form and emptiness is a huge teaching. Seeing with the eyes of Buddha, seeing non-discrimination, and also, you know, sameness and difference is a very old teaching. You know, we pull out the Sandokai, we could talk about that for a week. Um, you know, those teachings are there. This is one way in which those teachings hit the ground. This is one intersection of here's Buddha's teaching and then you know, here's how we actually live out the teaching. So I could have talked about lots of kinds of form and emptiness. I picked this one knowing it was tough and knowing that we're starting to have those conversations around our own Sangha. So, you know, certainly that con the conversation on Dharma and diversity is not new. It's been around for a bunch of years. It's not had a high profile. If you start looking for resources and writings and teachings and groups about this, of course, you know, this is not new. They've been around for a while, but they haven't had much of a high profile. Now, suddenly, everybody wants a piece of this thing. So my guess is resources will grow and become <laughs> available to Sanghas that want them. I just hope, though, um, that we never lose sight of the fact that in this particular kind of community, what we're bringing to these questions are Dharma teachings. So we can start with the Dharma teachings. And I mean, you could crack any Dharma book and find a probably a relevant teaching to this because it's, you know, when we look at Sangha as one of the three treasures, it's a wonderful practice ground, how do we get along? Because we may look around at our sanghas and say, well, statistically, they look a certain way. That doesn't mean everybody in the sangha has the same point of view 
We don't know by looking at somebody what's their political affiliation or you know, whatever. Um, so we have plenty of opportunities within the Sangha to work with our own hindrances and stuckness and, and awakening about just how do we get along you know, as a Sangha. Dogen had plenty of things to say about how we get along as a Sangha. Read the Ehe Shingi, which is the rules for being in a temple together. And it's about how do diverse human beings get along. And it says, you know, here's where we correct people and here's where we don't correct people. And here's how we treat new people when they come in. And, I mean, it's all, you know, quite relevant. So I think even a center that doesn't immediately have experts, um, and it's not to say that they shouldn't go find them, but it's, you know, I, I think in some ways we don't need to wait to start to think about issues of sameness and difference because those teachings exist, right? So that's the, for me, that's the basis. And then one particular way those teachings manifest is, you know, we get to talk about diversity and inclusion. I'm not answering your question because I don't have an answer. <laughs> but when I think about where do we start, I think gates like this are a place to start. You know, we could argue individually all day about the politics of it. That's that's not the point here, right? Uh, which isn't to say that shouldn't happen, but that's not the whole story. You know, when we look carefully, just how am I even treating my neighbor or my sister or my you know friend or my <clears throat> person sitting next to me in the zendo? We know there are differences. Everybody has different karmic circumstances. We can start right now, right? What would others like, or Satsu, if you have a follow-up, but what would others like to say about sameness and difference, how we encounter sameness and difference, how we see that, how we hold that? doesn't have to be about diversity. <laughs> it's a very big teaching. Sawyer, please. Yeah, first, I just want to, I feel that I want to thank you for for just delving into this and and uh, and feeling and just listening to you sort of move between all these considerations in a skillful way, you know. It feels I feel that we're in good hands, <laughs> um, genuinely, um, as we start to go into some of this stuff and. Um, and particularly to remember that we're coming to these questions from our own bodhicitta. I think that, you know, that is this ground um, that has great potential, um, obviously. And so I'm thinking back to one of the speakers in the beneficial action group. Um, I think his name was Daishin. Daishin McCabe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was talking about um, something that he's explored in some of this teaching, called a trauma sensitive Zen, mm -hmm. um, and and sort of talking about how when people have experienced trauma of some kind, post traumatic stress, uh, violence, um, addiction. Um, also, you know, sort of systemic marginalization, um, and that the practice of just telling people to, okay, sit and stare at the wall, there's a certain level of exposure that, that happens, um, and so there needs to be a kind of sensitivity um, when there's trauma involved. And so I'm wondering about that on, on you know, acute, intense trauma for, for certain individuals, and then a certain sense that so many of us are traumatized in ways that we don't fully understand. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm wondering about, in this practice, is there a way of empowering people at the same time as we're letting go of our egos that are, you know, trying to control things. Yeah, that too is a topic that gets talked about in the larger conversation. Um, so given who normally shows up in Dharma centers and what this sort of history of this practice is in this country, we tend to centralize zazen. 
And we say that's the one most important practice and it gets seen as a kind of a self-cultivation. And there are people for whom Zazen is contraindicated either because of trauma or because of mental state or whatever. Um, there are people who have experienced trauma in particular ways where sitting silently is re-traumatizing. Sitting facing a wall is re-traumatizing. You know, sitting with a group of people and not like making eye contact is re-traumatizing. So there are ways that um, something which we offer uh, very sincerely as a uh, wonderful means of finding balance and seeing clearly is actually contraindicated for some folks. Uh, so it's good that we have Zazen work and study. Um, it can be a wonderful practice to rake leaves, right? Or to wash dishes or to maybe do some Dharma study or something, because there are going to be some people for whom the kind of practice that we do here, we all come in, you know, we sit Sashin silently facing a wall 14 hours a day, not talking to anybody is really uncomfortable. Not because they're not deeply sincere practitioners, not because the body can't take it or something, it's because they're karmic circumstances, right? So it's, we need to be sure, I think, that we offer several kinds of practice, several kinds of gateways, right? There may be people who are not comfortable doing Zazen, but would love to come to a work day or would love to study with a study group and a discussion group maybe, right? And that has to, that really has to be okay. That really has to be okay. Um, so for, you know, there's this expectation that, you know, the first and only thing we ever do is Zazen. It's not that we should let go of Zazen. Zazen is important but we might have to find ways to make that more possible or to make practice more possible for people with a particular set of karmic circumstances. And we don't think about that. We just think, well, you know, Zazen is the be all and end all because <laughs> we love to do it. And it's what our teachers, you know, say is the most important thing. Yes, and. And I think it's true for all of us. There, there are always going to be times where somehow Zazen is not the right practice in this moment. Sometimes, it certainly happened to me, and maybe it's happened to others who sat Zazen, um, something is arising, something is going on, and you can kind of lose touch with self in a particular way. And maybe what you really need to be doing right now is kinyin, feeling your feet on the floor, grounding yourself in some kind of activity, keep Zazen in mind, but do something. I haven't had to do it here, but I've had to do it in other places. You know, just you have to take a period out and walk. You're not skipping Zaza to sleep. You need to do something else. Um, I've had to recommend to other people sometimes who are having, you know, something's arising for them. It's really strong. Well, maybe you need to walk or maybe you need to do a physical activity. Get yourself back in the here and now because we're so caught up with this, right? That, that has to be okay. There have to be ways to do that, right? So I think when Daishan's talking about these, talking about those things, he's adding a particular kind of skillfulness, right, to our practice and to our Dharma teaching. I think is really kind of important, right? I mean, you know, here we don't use kyosaku, big stick to hit people. In many Western Dharma centers, they found they can't use it because it's traumatizing to people who have histories of abuse or they have had some kind of experience, you know, PTSD or something. You know, if you're sitting there looking and facing the wall and the person next to you is getting whacked with a stick, I mean, that can really be unsettling if that's your karmic circumstance. So a lot of Dharma centers have said, you know, we put it on the altar or we just don't use it because in this culture for these people, it's, it's not helpful, right? So I think my broad answer to your question is <clears throat> there's more than one gateway and we need to be aware because people have different karmic circumstances. So it would be helpful not to exclude people from your sangha who can't do zazen for whatever reason they can't do it. You know, um, fortunately, we have zazen work and study. Fortunately, we have, you know, potlucks once in a while. <laughs> we can connect with each other. We can, you know, be Dharma friends with each other and support and help each other. Uh, maybe ultimately that person can begin to sit, but if not, uh, it's helpful not to judge. Do you want to follow up on anything there? Thanks for bringing up Daishin's work. By the way, anyone who's interested in reading about that, he's uh, got at least one article online. Daishin McCabe, he's with, um, he's in Iowa. He's in a Dharma Center in Iowa. What would others like to say today? Uh, Form an emptiness, please, Nate. Hey. 
So I, my, uh, my wife and I have, um, you know, had a very interesting experience with, <clears throat> with race. Um, and what I've found, you know, is that, you know, during, during this time, during the pandemic, uh, during, you know, this racial uprising, you know, what happened for us was kind of unintentional, but really beginning to look at and examine race in the United States uh, became a vehicle for an awakening for us, you know, because it was something we became aware of ourselves as white people and what participation and uh, assumptions uh, that we've had about our own, uh, what I want to say, uh, dominance in culture, um, and also seeing and truly reflecting upon the suffering of particularly African Americans in the United States. And, um, you know, for us, uh, it, and it was, It was it wasn't awakening, and, and 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 what happened after that is 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 for us it became the great white ox, and we cannot unsee it. You know we cannot unsee it because and through this you know we we were able to see our interdependence in, in connection with other people. You know because it, to me what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Sangas is this. You know, for an American, you know, we all live with the karma of slavery. You know, we, we live with this, we were born with this, and, and to, it's, it's, it's important for, to see and to understand um, our connection to that. Um, so, to dig into this stuff, it's, it's really uncomfortable. You know, it, it's really uncomfortable. Um, because you're, you're, you're looking at, you're zeroing in on um, old power structures, you know, old power structures within ourselves, within our society, and saying, you know what, I am, an, you know, I am an independent being, and I'm going to recognize other people as independent, sentient beings, and respect them for exactly what they are, you know, and instead of seeing any type of hierarchy in our mind because of programming. Um, that's, that's my experience. And so the whole thing is to really work for me. What, what I'm doing in my practice is re is working on the deprogramming of, you know, of, of all of the signals, the things I've been told. Um, so <clears throat> it's really challenging and it's, um, you know, I, I <clears throat> also uh, wanted to make mention that you know, when you're, when we're referring to, you know, the, the majority culture, uh, you, you know, within Zen, which is a, it's a big question and something really great to bring up. I mean, um, but, you know, it's, if we're, we're talking about majority uh, white um, people, um, might not be best to refer to them as dominant. Because um, <clears throat> that's kind of the problem. So is that that culture has been dominant. So anyhow. Um, so is majority a better yeah. term? Okay, sure. good, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, anyhow, uh, that's, that's, that's all I have, thanks. Good, thank you, okay, good, I learned something. I struggled with that a bit, I have to say, because I felt a bit uncomfortable with it, but I didn't know what else to use, so sure. thank you for that. Uh, Shikaku, please. Oh, sorry. I, I, me, uh, Chicago, and then you. <laughs> Please. I have my hand up. I, I thought you were calling on me. No, no, no. Not Ritoku, Chicago. Different okay. one. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, while we're doing our credentials, as my Dharma sister said, as a gay Latino male, uh, it is interesting. Um, 
to come into uh, in Western um, non-immigrant uh, Buddhist communities, which are predominantly uh, mainstream. Let's not use dominant then, statistically speaking. Um, though for me, uh, that's less of an issue. For me, more of an interesting point is to ask you uh, how you feel about the balance between different things. For instance, cultural appropriation seems to be a concern, but for instance, you can't walk into an Italian restaurant and not have an Italian food. I mean, to some extent, there's a characteristic. Uh, Fusatsu and I have talked about this, for instance, separating, for instance, there are, I don't want to name names, but there are teachers who strip the religious and spiritual context out of mindful technique, which I find dangerous, all right? So to some extent, if we say, well, we don't like to wear robes, we don't want to do this and this and this, I come back with, yes, but we bow when we walk into the Sangha, and that's not American either. So where are you going to draw the line? And, and finally, uh, my background as a Quaker is Quakers have confronted this problem in an effort to be as exclusive as possible. In many Quaker communities, they're reaching the point at which they are relaxing. It, it means more and more about less and less. So it's everything about nothing. There is no community because there is no anything there because anything goes and we can't exclude. So I'm fascinated to hear you're walking this, towing this line of balance and I appreciate your teaching. Oh, you know, I, <laughs> well, I'm laughing because when I began my practice, I was one of those practitioners who thought the, the best way to be the most Buddhist was to be the most Asian. <laughs> so I wanted all the Asian clothes, I wanted to you know, know all the words. I wanted to do all the forms because somehow I couldn't separate, you know, sort of what was cultural and what was Buddhist. Uh, and you know, okay, that was that was a learning process I needed to go through, right? Um, I'm sure when I the first time I ever went to Japan, which was before I went to actually formally train, but I was in another temple, you know, for a while before that. I'm sure that the people around me thought, "Oh my gosh, she's going to Japan. When she comes back, she's going to be worse than ever." <laughs> and as a matter of fact, when I got there, I actually saw it. there isn't one true way. You know, every temple's a little bit different. There's dialects of all of this practice, and I actually, you know, let go of a lot of that because I realized I was making it up. It was my idea about you know what good Asian Buddhism was or something. You know, fortunately, and you know, I was able to let go of that. So I think it can be a real challenge. And I know a lot of sanghas and teachers and practitioners struggle with how much of our practice is cultural and therefore somehow expendable um, and how much is not. And I think there's always going to be different answers for that. But for me, what it always comes down to is, is there some valuable teaching there? So when we're bowing, for instance, yeah, in America, that's not a typical gesture for us. Boy, do we need to bow. <laughs> it's like we need to be able to put the self over here. You know, and do something which is unfamiliar. And in my experience, because this is unfamiliar to me, I have to consider it. I have to think about it. I have to like pay attention to what I'm doing. Now, after, you know, 20 odd years, I bow without thinking about it. It's a reflex. But still, it's like I, I kind of need to think about what am I doing? So it's not about I'm doing this in order to look fancy or to look credible or something. It's like, now this is a practice, what do I do? So one of the things we often talk about when it comes to forms and rituals is, you know, we've all got rituals every day. Brushing your teeth is a ritual. Getting in your car is a ritual, right? The, the, the specific thing about what you're doing, the specific thing you're doing is probably not as important as what's my motivation, what's my practice, where's my heart and mind when I'm doing that thing. Um, we can take any habitual thing we do in a day and make it a form. I've talked many times about, you know, hearing from somebody once say, you know, when I'm driving and I pay attention to the to the uh, rear lights in the car in front of me and I say those are Buddha's eyes, you know, so like, what am I doing, right? We can make that a ritual and, you know, Dogen didn't tell us about driving down the street. So we can make that into anything. So where does the particular gesture form practice come from? Eh, probably not critical. This is not Japanese. It goes back to India. I mean, so we could really take our practice apart and say, well, all of these things, you know, are there's been so much syncretism 
from you know India through along the, the Silk Road to China to Korea to Japan that I mean it's like anymore we can't kind of take the pieces apart so you know there are things we can adopt and just say this is what we do because our teachers taught us to do it and we don't need to get too concerned about that so when I'm bringing up things you know concerns that I'm hearing about cultural appropriation again I think it has mostly to do with what's the motivation am I putting something on the wall in order to look like something or to be exotic or because when people arrive, they expect some kind of exotic temple atmosphere. Or am I doing that because maybe that's my teacher's calligraphy, or maybe that's a phrase which is meaningful in my practice or something, right? I'm not here to say we should strip all of that out because I, I do think in some ways, as you say, it can be dangerous because we start losing context. Now we're picking and choosing, this element feels comfortable to me, but this one doesn't feel comfortable to me and therefore it's not relevant, so I'm gonna get rid of it. Rather than saying, okay, if I'm not comfortable with that element, why not? What is it about that element that brought it into the practice in the first place? So there's like some teaching there, right? Uh, and the other thing we have to be careful about is if we start stripping things out, well, you know, our, our practice, any religious tradition develops because there's something in there which is meaningful for people. So if we're not going to do this or that element, what are we going to replace it with that's going to meet the need? It arose there because there was a human need. So if we've gotten rid of that piece, okay, that doesn't mean the need has gone away. So, you know, what are we gonna do instead? Maybe it's, you know, some other practice, some other tradition, some other, I mean, you know, we look at a lot of, even in America, you know, we look at what Dharma centers are doing in there. Uh, there's one center I know about that, that does its ending bodhisattva vows after the talk. They do it in something that's like four part harmony that sounds very Christian. You know, they hand out the music sheets and they say, pick a part. And then it sounds very crisp. It's really interesting. They're, you know, the chanting bodhisattva vows, but they're doing it in what sounds like a hymn, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know, maybe for them that's meaningful and it meets a need for that. So I don't think there's an um, easy answer to leave this in, take that out. What I'm suggesting is let's look at why we're uh, including things that may seem to be exotic. And are we building some ego around that? You know, are we creating a story around that? Do we know why we're including those things? You know, one of the important elements of Sanchi and style is we keep our form simple so that we know what we're doing and why. We're not doing things just because we're expected to do them. When I arrived, I said to Hoda-san, gee, should we be doing all of the liturgical calendar that I learned in the training temple in Japan, Bodhisattva Memorial Day and all this and that? And he's like, oh, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we need to do things simply and in ways that remind us about what we're doing and why. So I think if we take that approach, that's skillful. Is that enough about that? Do you want to follow up anymore? No, thank you. <laughs> that's that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, what would others like to say? Anything else this morning? Difference in sameness? Mark, please. Yeah, I, I'm always hesitant to speak. Um, it seems like there's, I'm seeing a theme in every, what everyone's talking about and it seems, and for me the theme is be uncomfortable mm. and work with the uncomfortableness. Um, Sawyer was talking about, you know, when we were talking about the trauma and whatnot. It's traumatic for me in the morning, um, early morning um, before Sazen starts, because you don't say anything to people. And you, know, you really don't, you really don't acknowledge the other person. It's kind of a weird thing. And what happened, and so I have, yeah, I want everybody to like me. And so I see certain things popping up and it makes me uncomfortable. And so I have to work with it, you know, I, I have to tell myself what's going on and I have to work with that uncomfortableness. Um, for Fusatsu, you know, how to start locally, <clears throat> sit with uncomfortable. <laughs> it's as soon as we're comfortable, we're in our old routines and old ruts. My best friend is a highly educated educator lesbian, and she has no problem putting me in my place. And I love her for it. As a matter of fact, I don't understand why we're best friends. <laughs> for, you know, for all the stuff that I bring up um, from my wonderful history, karma. And so when I'm with her, I have to learn to be uncomfortable. And it is a godsend or a Buddha send. Because it is just, 
It's me not being me, and it's being able to see both sides. And then from that, hopefully later on, I will make a better decision and a better action that expresses both sides. So. Mm -hmm. I think you're not wrong. Um, I think practice takes courage, you know? Um, it's not easy to sit down and look at the wall and face ourselves. There are some things about ourselves we would rather ignore or suppress or disconnect from. So I frequently said here, our practice is so much about reintegration, right? It's about seeing all the pieces that we don't want to see and kind of recognizing that that connection is already there. Um, and accepting the parts of ourselves where we're still stuck and we still have hindrance and you know where our practice is not complete and again this is why we have vow and repentance it's right it's why these two things are two halves of the same thing right um you know we vow to practice in a certain way we vow to, to walk the buddha path we vow to you know liberate beings and do our very best with our practice and we also know that our practice is always going to be incomplete there's always going to be something that we haven't done or some mistake we make or something we say or some unskillful action um, and in the next moment, you know, so we recognize that we recognize our practice is incomplete. We are uncomfortable. And in the next moment, we vow to, you know, walk this path, <laughs> follow the precepts, be skillful, be wise, be compassionate, be in touch with our awakening. Right. So I think there's a lot of courage required in this practice. And I think we don't always, I'm pretty sure we don't always understand that when we first come in and sit down. When we first take up this practice, we're, you know, we're thinking, oh, this is great. It's going to resolve all my suffering. I'm going to be happy now. I'm going to be contented and peaceful, and everyone's going to love me. I'm going to be someone I like better. I'm never going to make any more mistakes. I'm going to be a you know, great enlightened person because I'm going to you know, do this practice. Oh, my goodness. Then we sit down, and you know, <laughs> everything starts coming at us. How often have we heard you know, newer practitioners say, my goodness, when I sat down, my mind was busier than ever. No, it's just that we're now in touch with the busyness and the distraction and the hindrance and all that stuff. So is that uncomfortable? You bet. So this discomfort is not just about my knees hurt when I sit, you know, 50 minutes. It's about uh, there's stuff coming up that I really don't want to look at. So Sangha is both a blessing and a curse in that way. <laughs> sangha is a wonderful container of people who have the same aspiration that we do. You know, we've all got bodhicitta. We're all trying to direct our lives toward, you know, living the way Buddha lived and we're all going to fall down. And so, you know, our practice gets reflected back to us by Sangha. There's a reason Sangha is one of the three treasures. So, you know, that's the Sangha in the Zendo, but you know, in Milgan's case, it's the Sangha of friends and family that pointed out to us to say, you know what, you've gone off the rails. <laughs> Here's where and why, you know, if you have that trust relationship, uh, one would hope that's a that's done with wisdom and compassion, right? Um, yeah, so this is why sometimes I talk about things like encouraging en encouragement and having faith and how do we stay, you know, with this practice and make this continuing kind of effort because we fall down all the time and then we get back up and then we fall down all the time we get back up and that's how we notice where our hindrances are next time maybe we get to do something different but the challenge is that in this form of five skandhas we have habituated thinking we've got very deeply ingrained conditioned patterns of thinking and behavior and understanding and all uh, so every time somebody comes along and pricks that bubble and says you know what <laughs> you didn't see this piece oh that's actually compassionate action so with luck, we surround ourselves with skillful Sangha members and teachers uh, who, when they point these things out to us, do that in a way which um, is encouraging and not discouraging, right? It's about encouraging. You have another opportunity by, you know, rep doing repentance and turning right around and doing value. You have another opportunity to sort of start again. Uh, you know, I'm going to be a Bodhisattva in this moment and in this moment and in this moment, and you know, we get to start again and again and again and again. So um, I, I hope we can all take our courage in our hands and continue to sit or do work or do study or whatever our practice is. It's not easy. No one said it was easy. Fortunately, we have Sangha to hold us up, yeah. right? What would others like to say? We're getting down past 1130, so other 
reflections this morning, comments, questions? We good for today? All right. So I'm going to pitch back to Hoshin. We'll do our closing chants, and we will wrap up and do some announcements. So thanks for your practice this morning.